Thank you all for joining tonight's presentation, Vertibility, a panel discussion. We're glad to see so many Audubon leaders and supporters here. We're gonna get started very soon. We're just letting everyone join. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Again, thank you all for joining. Appreciate you taking your time out. And welcome to Birdability Week 2020. It's part of Disability Awareness Month. We're so thrilled to have you all join us. It's gonna be an excellent panel discussion this evening. And as Virginia Rose likes to say, a celebration that birding is for everyone. I'm Heather Stark. I'm our VP of Grassroots Capacity Building at National Audubon Society. And tonight you're gonna to be hearing from an excellent, excellent panel of birders who are gonna be discussing access considerations and their own experience of birding with disabilities. Our presenters are gonna be ready to start discussing um, a lot of different exciting things with you tonight, just after a couple of brief housekeeping announcements. Um, all of our attendees are going to be muted throughout the webinar, so you can um, contact us, um, ask questions through the chat, so please do so throughout, and we are going to have a great question and answer um, at the end of the discussion. Um, we also want to let you know that the webinar is being recorded, um, so we want to make sure that lots and lots of people will be able to listen and join in with this later. Um, I also just want to warn you that the, everything in the chat box <laughs> will be able to be seen later. So just take that under consideration. Um, we will be able to share this out later in lots of different ways, the recording. So it will be on audubon.org um, backslash birdability. Um, we will be emailing it to everyone that has registered for this webinar. And you'll also be able to find it on our Facebook page. So now it's my pleasure to introduce um, one of my good friends, Joe Watts, who is the Vice President of Programs for Alabama Audubon. He's also on our National uh, Audubon Board of Directors. Um, Joe has done quite a bit in the state of Alabama um, to help people um, enjoy nature. He's been involved in writing legislation to, um, for Alabama's Scenic Byways Program. Um, he's done quite a lot of statewide tourism projects there. Um, one of my favorite things he does is to help the next generation. He's working a lot with our um, campus chapter program there that's new at Tuskegee University. And uh, he also participates in the Birdability Affinity Group. So Joe, take it away. Great. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm really excited to see what just three months ago was a grain of an idea come to life. It's Birdability Week uh, and birding really is for everybody. Um, just drop, I'm going to drop the information about into the chat box about contacting our panelists at the end of the uh, presentation. And during the Q&A, we're going to try to answer as many questions and ask as many of your questions as we possibly can, but be sure to check audubon.org slash birdability for more info. There's a lot of information there and it's going to continue to grow. Uh, check us out on social media and you'll find a lot of questions that are answered there. So we're really looking forward to everything. Uh, I can't say enough about how we, we just couldn't have accomplished what we've done in these last three months without all the wonderful support from National Audubon and all the passion of all the panelists here and the folks that have made the Birdability Affinity Group happen. So thank you for that. Uh, I could go on and on, but I'm not. I'm going to now hand it over to Freya McGregor 
who is part of our Birdability Affinity Group and who has been working tirelessly for the last three months to make this happen. So I'm going to disappear for a little while and I'll see you guys soon. Thanks very much, Joe. Hi, everyone. I'm Freya McGregor. Um, I'm really excited to, um, to be here tonight with you all, um, audience members and panelists. It's, this is going to be a really interesting conversation. I'm looking forward to learning a lot from our panelists. Um, before we get started, I just want to make sure um, to mention that the panelists here tonight are a small sample of all the different birders um, who experience accessibility challenges. Um, we don't claim to represent everybody. Every different person has a different story and a different set of experiences. And so this is just the start of the conversation. Um, and we're looking forward to growing it as, as bird the birdability movement continues to grow after this week. Um, we also encourage you to talk about anyone, uh, talk with anyone you know who has accessibility challenges themselves and hear their story. Um, because it may be similar to some of the stories you hear tonight and maybe completely different. So um, this, as I said, this is just the start of the conversation. Um, I also want to acknowledge that there are certainly other barriers to accessing birding um, than, um, than disabilities. So barriers like racism um, and homophobia and um, limited access to financial resources. Uh, we're not going to talk much about that tonight, um, but I just want to acknowledge that they, we, we're, we're well aware that there are also barriers to accessing birding and birdability certainly supports all the work that's being done um, to try and break down those barriers as well. Um, we're also, I'm just going to define at the start, going to define the, the use of the word disability. So we'll be using that word tonight. Um, I'm just going to read my definition here. Um, so we'll be using dis disability to include anyone who experiences, a who has, sorry, a mobility challenge, a sensory impairment, um, to include um, birders who are deaf or hard of hearing and who are blind or have a vision impairment, um, intellectual or developmental disabilities, which includes autism, mental illnesses, and other health concerns that impact their ability to, to participate in birding as they would like. Finally, um, it's important to acknowledge that every human being is complex and you can't break bits of people apart from other bits of that same person. And so um, the birders who have, um, who have a disability, um, that's one barrier, one big barrier, but birders who have a disability and also uh, maybe a black indigenous and people of color or identify as LGBTQIA plus, um, will experience both sets of barriers at once. And that intersectional oppression um, will have an even bigger impact on their ability to go birding. So um, we at BirdAbility believe that Black Lives Matter and we want to support um, BIPOC and LGBTQIA plus birders tell their stories too. So one final note, um, if anyone in the audience has a vision impairment, um, I will be verbalizing anything that would otherwise be visual information only, so you won't miss out on anything. And um, unfortunately, we did try to get closed captions uh, and an interpreter for this event, but as Joe mentioned, this whole week got pulled together in three months by three volunteers with the support of National Audubon, and um, unfortunately we weren't able to, but stand by, we, we will do our best uh, next time. So, oh, with all that out of the way, Let's meet our panel. Hi, panelists. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi, friend. <laughs> so um, let's start. We're going to start with Virginia first, but let's start with your name and where you live at the moment. And then in 30 seconds or less, tell us how you go birding. So if you go birding by walking or you like birding in bird blinds. And yeah, 30 seconds. Virginia, you're up. All right. I'm Virginia Rose. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. I am living in Austin, Texas. I hope until my last day. It's a wonderful place to live. The way I bird is in a wheelchair. I've been in a wheelchair for 47 years, and I bird all over this country on every accessible trail I can get on, and I love it. Thanks, Freya. That's awesome. Hey, Jerry, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us how you go birding? Hi, my name is Jerry Barrier. I live in Malden, Massachusetts, which is near Boston. And I uh, go birding. I'm a person who is blind, so I uh, mostly go birding with other people when I can. Although the truth is I do most of my birding right from where I'm sitting right now because I have microphones 
mounted on the back and front of my house and I can hear them through my audio mixer into my computer and I can even record things if I want to try to identify them later. Thank you. That's awesome. Super cool, Jerry. Um, Sarah, how do, how do you go birding and, and where do you live? Um, yeah, thanks, Freya. I live in Newtown, Connecticut, and I too bird from a wheelchair. I um, have been in a wheelchair since 2008, and I do it in a, however I can, whatever's available to me. Sometimes it's just from my car, although that's my least favorite. But I love going out to the trails, and um, my favorite is when I have a friend, but sometimes that's not possible, and so yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Diane. Now, Diane is actually here representing two people at the same time, which is really cool. So Diane's intro might last a little longer. Um, Diane, would you like to introduce yourself and, and Allison? Sure. My name's Diane Allison, and I live in Upper Bucks County in Pennsylvania. Uh, it's just north of Philadelphia. And I like to bird anywhere, any way I can. I do car birding, sitting birding, uh, any type that I can. And the other person that I want to introduce tonight is uh, a best friend, uh, Allison McCool, who uh, suffered from multiple sclerosis, and we birded together for many years. Um, she moved from cane to walker to wheelchair, and as she made that transition to full-time wheelchair use, uh, she said to me one day, I don't think I'm going to be able to bird with you anymore, and I said, no, we, we, can, we can. We just have to do it differently. And so we pursued all kinds of ways to bird, like I said, sitting, driving, however we could do it. So the perspective that I will be bringing tonight is what she taught me through all those years of uh, birding with someone who had accessibility challenges. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Diane. And just if anyone's confused, Diane's last name is Allison and her best friend's name is Allison. So um, just, just, that's just kind of fun. Um, who else have we got? Alexander. Alexander, where are you at and how do you bird? Hello, I am Alexander DeBarros. I live in Burbank, California, which is a part of Los Angeles. I bird uh, really just uh, like Diane any way I can, whether it's uh, walking, uh, biking, car, just sitting. If I can bird, I will bird. <laughs> That's awesome, super cool. And Melanie, so Melanie is another special category of pan panelists tonight. Um, but Melanie, please introduce yourself and let us know how you bird. Hi, I'm Melanie Fur from Atlanta, Georgia. And I, like the others, like to bird wherever I am, however I can. But my favorite way to go birding is just to step out on my back porch with my morning cup of coffee. That's super cool. Um, so that's really an interesting um, collection of different ways that anyone, someone can go birding. And I would like um, a change in the broader birding community to define birding and a birder, because I think that a birder is someone who enjoys, what, uh, who enjoys wild birds, not watching, listening. I listen to birds, but I'm sighted. Um, it doesn't, they don't have to, you don't have to own binoculars, you don't have to walk, you don't have to go on field trips, you don't have to know what they're even called. If you enjoy them, you're a birder and that's birding. And I think that using, using that sort of terminology can help include and welcome so many different people, especially uh, new birders or potential, potential future birders, um, which is everybody who's not already a birder. Um, and, and I think that shift in language um, could be really powerful. So I, um, I would like to see that change in, in the wider birding community. So um, panelists, uh, another 30 second answer, please. Um, what, what got you into birding? What, how did it start? Um, let's, start with, let's start with Sarah. Oh gosh. Well, um, when I was growing up, um, my mom was a birder and I thought it was the most boring thing that anybody ever invented. Um, but after my spinal cord injury, I, um, I began to take a very strong interest in conservation and things like um, pollinator gardens. I'm a landscape designer, so I got involved with a pollinator group. And the more I learned about the connection between the pollinators and birds, and um, I just developed this really keen interest in birds. And so that's held on and I, um, I'm just soaking it up as much as I can. 
and so and so you came to birding really like apart from when you were not really excited as a kid you, you really came to birding after your spinal cord injury is that right yes I was always pretty interested but I was so busy I was just mm -hmm. I was working I always had somewhere to be and somehow the injury slowed me down and I really was able to observe more and it really has been kind of a blessing I have to yeah. say yeah How's that, guys? That's really cool. It, disability is not all negative. That's a really important message right there. Thank you, Sarah. That's that's really powerful. Um, Alexander, what got you into birding? So uh, 10 years ago, I was, uh, oh, a little further back, I've always been interested in science and I had been learning a lot about whales, but I was starting to get bored with that because you can't really see 10 species of whales while walking to school. <laughs> and then I started, I went to a bookstore and I found a book on birds, actually this book on birds, nice. and started <laughs> flipping through it to some what, of the species. What's the title, birds. Alexander, just so anyone who can't it's see the, can... It's the National Geographic Field Guide to Birds of Western North America by John Dunn and Jonathan Alderfer. Thank you. But yeah, I started looking through this and some of the birds look cool. And yeah, 10 years later, it's just who I am. That's fantastic. That's awesome. Kind of transitioning from whales to birds just by a good, good encounter in a bookstore. I love it. Um, Jerry, Jerry, what, what got you into birding? Well, I was a psych major when I was in college and I had to take one biology course and my professor didn't know what to do with me during the lab portion of the course. Uh, so he gave me uh, Cornell recordings to listen to and said, I want you to try to learn some of the bird sounds and your grade will be based on a walk with me at the end of the semester where we're gonna see how much you've learned. And at first they all sounded alike to me and I found it, you know, I wasn't all that interested in it, but by the end of the semester, I was totally hooked and I've been doing it ever since. That's so cool. Jerry, how long ago were you in college? Uh, that would have been around 1972. Yeah, how's that? Oh, and <laughs> <laughs> a veteran birder. Um, yeah. I'd just like to point out guys, that's an amazing story of how one person who started thinking out of the box um, and found a way to include Jerry um, at, at a, where he could participate in an, in an equivalent um, type of activity. Not only did it mean he could participate in his biology class, but it also gave him a lifelong passion. And that's, that was one person who just took, I don't know, half an hour maybe to think outside the box and come up with that. And that's just such a powerful message right there. That's, that's really, really cool. I love, I love that story, Jerry. Um, Melanie, Melanie, what got you into birding? I got into birding about 10 years ago when I started volunteering at a wildlife rehabilitation center. And the first uh, area that I was trained in was the baby bird room where I was feeding the baby birds and you'd go down the row and get done with the row and then go start again. Um, but I didn't know a lot about them. And so I got curious and I went on my first Audubon bird walk. And it was like someone took blinders off of me because I saw and heard birds that I did not even know existed um, before that, that spring day. And the rest is history. I've been hooked ever since. And you're professionally hooked as well, I believe. Yes. I so work as the director of education for Georgia Audubon. And okay. I still get to tie in my wildlife rehab work. I'm the caregiver for our non-flighted, non-releasable ruby-throated hummingbird ambassador. So Aww. that's super cool. Thanks, Melanie. Um, Virginia, Virginia, what got you into birding? Um, I think I was just casting about um, for something else to do on a Friday night and heard on the radio uh, NPR, that there was going to be a birding program at a neighborhood church. So I decided, hey, that sounds like fun. And um, so I went and that was it. Um, I immediately joined Travis Audubon, took all their classes, went on all their field trips, and never looked back. And that was 17 years ago. Awesome. 
super cool i love i love these chance encounters that just just create such a such a awesome opportunity um diane diane and allison how how did you guys get into birding well uh we were both into it for quite some time when we first knew each other we weren't into it big but we both loved nature um, my father had been a birder and like sarah i wasn't real interested because it was his interest uh, and then when i moved into my home I had a Northern Harrier go by the window one day and wow, what's that? And I had to figure it out. And then I had the opportunity to go on a Christmas count with a gentleman that was a top notch birder in the county and had me go with him because he never wanted to send a new birder with the groups that were already established. And he was amazing, an amazing mentor. And I just, I mean, I just fell in love with birds and I am just a, a total bird brain now. And that's all I, <laughs> I like to do in my spare time, that's it. And awesome. Allison, Allison pre, I guess I should mention to the folks too that Allison passed away um, February a year ago. And so, um, you know, the things that I say will be experiences that we had uh, together. Um, she, she just evolved as a birder. I mean, I was interested and I started taking her along on uh, bird outings and uh, just pulled her along and she just blossomed into the whole thing and she became a member of the flock and then she was sold too. So then it became awesome. uh, a passion for both of us. Bring your friends to birding outings, guys. <laughs> you never know what happens because of it. Um, that's really cool. Okay. Um, so I'm just watching the clock. I had a couple more introductory type questions to ask, but we might have to save them for a future event. Um, but I just wanted to talk um, briefly about this word disability. Um, I know uh, in the birding community and in the wider community, there can be a lot of um, misunderstanding and confusion and awkwardness about certain words and whether they're appropriate to use or they're rude. Um, the Birdability Affinity Group, we've put together a... Um, a kind of a, it's called a guidance document, language and communication tips. It's um, on our website, which is audubon.org slash birdability. That's the website. Everything we know is there, um, except the things I'm still working on, which hopefully will be up tomorrow night. Um, but um, that's a document that's just a good place to start. We're not claiming to know everything. Um, certainly we would wel welcome your feedback. Um, if there's words in there, that if there's words you would like us to define in there, um, please let us know. And we're certainly not trying to imply that these words apply to everybody because like I said at the start, every single person is a different person. Everyone has different preferences. Um, so it's just a starting point. So at least you have somewhere to kind of feel a little bit more comfortable when you begin these conversations. So I just wanna ask Jerry first and then Virginia. Um, Jerry, if someone said to you that you have a disability or that you are disabled, how do you feel about that word and, and as it applies to you? Well, I use the word disability. I don't usually say I'm disabled because I've always thought of disabled as being like a car that's stuck in the middle of the road and won't go anywhere, where a disability maybe defines one aspect of me. It doesn't define who I am. So I'm okay with the word disability. Sure. And I wonder if that sort of points to the whole person first language where you say things like a person who uses a wheelchair yes um rather rather than i think wheelchair user is okay maybe that was a bad example but you say the person who you don't mm -hmm. say you don't for example we haven't got anyone on the panel as far as i know who has epilepsy but usually people don't like being called epileptic they would rather be called a person or be described as a person who has epilepsy they'd probably rather be called by their name <laughs> <laughs> in first place um but but that person first thing is a really good way to start person who um so a person who has a disability they also may have um brown hair and also may have uh a cousin and three cats so like jerry said that using it like that is one way of describing one part of them but it's not defining them as an entire human being thanks jerry um virginia how do you feel about the word disability and when it's applied to you? Um, thank you for that question. I do uh, prefer not to use the word dis disabled, uh, mainly because I think it focuses on what we cannot do. And um, I'm all about doing what I can do and recognizing what everybody else can do. Sure, absolutely. 
but if someone said to you, oh, like, you know, I'm, I keep using this word disability in this panel, um, in general, is it okay? You would just prefer not to use it yourself? Is that, is, is that right or? Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like there are reasons to use the word disability, mainly because I think that's what people are accustomed to hearing. Mm -hmm. And so the familiarity of that word, I think is important, particularly right now. But mm -hmm. I think as time goes on and as we all become more knowledgeable, um, that word will be um, sent away and it'll mm -hmm. be replaced by other, I think, more positive words. Yeah, interesting. And then, so um, I'm actually an occupational therapist. So occupational therapy is a healthcare profession um, that aims to enable people um, to do the things that are important to them in their everyday life, like showering and dressing and birding, um, that they can't do usually because of an illness, an injury or a disability. And so, um, and the three ways that OTs usually, OTs, occupational therapists usually do this are by um, modifying the task, uh, teaching new skills to the person or the people around them, uh, and by adapting, by modifying the institutional physical cultural or social environment so it's a pretty amazing job guys you should all be OTs um but um it's it's really broad as you can tell by that explanation but uh this birdability is just so up my alley the whole point of birdability is to start breaking down these barriers so that people can go birding like that's that's exactly what occupational therapy is but the reason the reason I say this is because as a healthcare professional the language that I use um, is generally a bit more medical and kind of um, formal and that's appropriate in that context but maybe individual people kind of feel a bit weird about about it so it's just it's just something to throw out there everyone has their own different um, different opinions and different preferences so um, I also want to throw out there this idea just just to get you thinking about the concept of Perhaps it's not the person who has the disability. Perhaps it is the environment that is disabling. Mm. Absolutely. Because if you can get around and do the things you want to do and there's no barriers, physical barriers in front of you, um, and like Virginia has, you know, is wheeling around on all these accessible trails, the environment enables her to participate in birding and she does not feel disabled. But if she comes to a staircase <laughs> that she can't navigate, well, now the environment is disabling. So it's just an interesting, just an interesting thing. We won't go into it any further than that, but I just wanted to throw that out there because it's an interesting reframing of the concept of disability. All right. So let's talk about some of the physical accessibility challenges you guys have experienced while trying to go birding. And um, we're defining accessibility challenges as what I said basically before in the OT definition, the difficulty someone experiences in interacting with or while using the physical or social environment when trying to engage in a meaningful activity, which is in this case, birding. Um, so quick questions, panelists, hands up if you've ever had difficulty going birding due to inaccessible trails or facilities. So that was, how many of us are there? There's one, two, three, okay. So that was everyone except Melanie and Alexander. Okay, so there was there was five of us, I can't count. Five of us had our hands up there, two of us didn't. Okay, hands up if you've tried to find out accessibility information on a nature center or state park or other birding locations website, but couldn't. That's everyone except Jerry. Mm -hmm. Okay. And hands up if you've ever been to a birding location but couldn't get to the birds because of parking or other physical obstacles or barriers. Okay. So that's everyone except Melanie and Jerry. That included Alexander and me. So there you go. Everyone's going to have different experiences. And something else to point out if it wasn't... Um, clear already is that um, birders with vision impairments like Jerry are going to have a whole lot of different experiences and barriers than birders who use wheelchairs. 
Um, a lot of it might overlap, but a fair bit of it is quite different. So that's just something else to throw into the conversation. Sorry. Could I, could I chime in something there Please. about that? Um, there's also a large variety of people who are wheelchair users and their abilities as well. For instance, Allison had no upper body strength as well as not being able to stand. So therefore she could not na navigate some places that perhaps Virginia could. So there's differences even within that group. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you, Diane, for pointing that out. And Virginia, I know Virginia is super strong. She's been using a wheelchair for 47 years. Uh, that's a long time. You probably get some mad skills in that time. And <laughs> she, she spends a lot of time out outside going birding. So she's getting even stronger. Um, and developing her wheelchair skill even more. Um, and as far as I know, Virginia doesn't have any other health concerns because plenty of people have more than one medical condition or disability or, or um, uh, Alexander's nodding really hard there. Hey, Alexander, do you want to share your story there just briefly? So uh, I have uh, autism and uh, type one diabetes. I was diagnosed with uh, T1D when I was uh, five years old and uh, my parents had suspected autism for a long time, but I wasn't formally diagnosed until I was 17. But both of those affect a lot of my life, a lot of my schooling, and the way I go birding. Yeah, okay. So, so Alexander, can you tell us a little bit about, um, so T1D1, type 1 diabetes, right? Um, how does your diabetes impact your ability to go birding and how does your autism impact your ability to go birding? So with my uh, diabetes, uh, the issue is that uh, my pancreas no longer produces insulin, which is the hormone that allows you to uh, digest to uh, actually absorb your food. So uh, I have to control all of that stuff manually. Got, sorry, uh, sorry, I think we just lost you there for a monitor. second. Alexander, sorry, it was sugar, right? Sugar, we just lost you. That's what you can't absorb? Oh, yeah. Do you right, thank you, now? sorry. Yes, yes, okay. it'll be good. Just that little moment. Yep, it's just yeah. a key word. <laughs> but to, I need to regulate all of it manually. I've got a continuous blood glucose monitor at uh, Dexcom, but uh, I always need to make sure that I have uh, enough uh, glucose uh, that my blood sugar is in a uh, stable area. So that way I can uh, make sure that I'll actually uh, make it through all the bird walk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the uh, autism, that's uh, more of a sensory issue. I, uh, I experience uh, light and sound much more intensely than a neurotypical person. So uh, living, in, uh, living in a city that can be overstimulating at times, but uh, when I'm out in the middle of nowhere, just uh, listening for birds, it, the heightened senses can actually be an advantage. Sure, that's really cool. Um, so um, just just delving in there a second more, um, Alexander, I, what I also just heard you say between the lines was that, again, your disability can be a positive with birding. Is that what you just said about autism and your heightened senses? S sensory experiences, oh, yes. yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Really cool. Um, um, and the diabetes. So you said sometimes you have to be really careful about your blood sugar level when you're out on a trail. So um, what kind of uh, like time frames are we talking about? Or what, what would happen if you miscalculated and, and something went haywire? What, 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 um, yeah, can you tell us a bit more about that? If my blood sugar, it, there's a range where it uh, normally should be, the target range. If it goes uh, too high, then I get uh, really uh, lethargic. If it stays high for uh, too long, and we're talking uh, months or years here, I, will, I would need to be hospitalized. If it, my blood sugar goes too low, there's a more immediate danger. Because if uh, there's uh, no sugar to power it my cells, then uh, if it gets too low, I can just pass out. Fortunately, that has never happened in uh, the last 16 years, but it's uh, always a possibility. Sure. So you've got to be pretty conscious of that then in, any, in anything you're doing, right? How, how frequently do you have to kind of check up on, on your blood sugar level? Uh, sometimes I just feel it. 
the Dexcom does uh, transmit directly to my phone, so uh, I can just uh, check my blood sugar any time, and it's 85 right now, which is good. Awesome. Yeah, okay. But it's a, that's a whole other thing you've got to keep in the back of your head on a bird on a bird outing or anything. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you for sharing, Alexander. That's really interesting. And it sounds like, um, although it might be easy to think that autism maybe impacts your ability to go birding more, it sounds like, in fact, diabetes is the bigger, the big, the bigger potential impact. Is that is that right? Yeah, the diabetes. That's more of the lingering storm cloud. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks for sharing. Um, wow. Um, thank you. I, I've forgotten quite where I was before. That was really interesting. So thank you, thank you, Alexander. So. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> Oh no, I know where I, where I am. Okay, um, <laughs> so everybody, panelists, um, we just heard a really great um, story from Alexander. I'd love to hear a story in, I don't know, 90 seconds, if you can manage to time that, um, um, from each of you about um, one of the physical challenges that you have experienced when trying to go birding. I don't know if, if maybe that was this one time when you Went to this great trail and there was a tree down halfway and you couldn't get past the tree that that kind of a story um so i want to hear about the physical accessibility challenge you you came across and i want to hear about what you did next whether you turn around and went home or you could problem solve your way out of it um so uh diane have you got a story to share in that in that area uh yeah um we were uh, birding in Bosque del Apache, uh, refuge in New Mexico, Allison and I, and um, there were some uh, surfaces that were that were difficult. Um, we spot I spotted a, uh, a, a kite, and it's not a bird that should be there really. So uh, I tried to get her on it, and um, one of the main difficulties that we often have when we're uh, when we were car birding and all is perspective. And I guess that's something I'd like to just spend a second on perspective. Um, we have to remember as bird leaders, uh, if we're leading an outing or, or whatever, to, to take the person's perspective. And Allison sometimes forcefully uh, taught me about perspective because I would point to a bird, try to show it to her, but since she couldn't move very well and uh, she obviously shouldn't, couldn't get out of the vehicle and look or whatever, um, if I didn't have the vehicle pointed quite correctly, then she was seeing a different spot than I was. And the same thing could be said for um, if I'm birding with Virginia and I say, there's a scarlet tanager in that tree and it's at three o'clock and it's, you know, and she's, I don't see it. And, and so you need to go to the person and take their perspective, see it through their eyes, get down on your knee and look at the same spot that Virginia's seeing. At 6-1, I'm seeing a different thing than Virginia is. And so I need to get down into her spot, see her perspective and help her see that bird. There's nothing more frustrating for birders with disabilities or birders, new birders in general, when they go on an outing and they don't see most of what is being seen because someone hasn't helped them find the bird and take their perspective. So um, uh, that particular incident where we it was difficult to get to it, we did overcome it. We I just quickly got out and got the wheelchair and got her in it and got her out of the vehicle so that she could get a different perspective. Um, and so I would, I would say that that's, a, <clears throat> that's something we all need to take into consideration. Yeah, thanks, Diane. That's really powerful. Um, I also, I'll just take a moment there um, to talk about pointing things out when you're working or birding with someone who has a vision impairment. I'm going to call on you, Jerry. Um, if someone says, hey, do you see that bird over there and points, is that very helpful for you? <laughs> no, and, and it happens quite often, especially with close family members because they just forget sometimes, but mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure. But what about, okay, just, and then a slight deviation. What about when someone says to you, to you see you later? Is that because you will not literally see them ever, is that yeah. is that offensive if someone no. uses words like see to you? No, not not in the least. That's perfectly acceptable language. I say it all the time, even to my blind friends. You know, well, it's just a common way of saying I will 
I will interact with you later. People say, I'll see you later. And uh, it's very acceptable. Sure. And it's not, we, and, and if someone was like, Hey, see you uh, 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 later, <laughs> would that, that just makes it weird, right? Like for both of you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So see you later is fine, but yes. see that bird over there point is not very helpful. <laughs> not helpful, but not particularly offensive either. Um, sure. Yeah. How, how would you prefer someone to help you um, get your ears on a bird if they're out birding with you? What kind of words and um, direction well, would be helpful for you? I have to say that as I've gotten older, I've developed some high frequency hearing loss. And my wife, who never had any interest in birds until we uh, started hanging around together a few years ago, will now say, what is that? And I'll say, what is what? I'm tempted to say, oh, it's just a sparrow. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but sometimes she'll yeah, say, okay. and I don't even um, hear anything. Oh. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that, um, I guess, so um, high frequency, high frequency hearing loss is yes. um, a normal part of aging. And my understanding is that it happens to men usually a little bit earlier than yeah. women so what you just described is like totally normal <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, and and i wonder i'm not trying to tell you what to do but i wonder if i have, I have a really good friend who um has um albinism and he has low vision a vision impairment as a result of that and he he uh, got himself he was he's older than me um he's actually an occupational therapist as well and he he got himself some hearing aids a couple of years ago and he said it blew his mind. He didn't realize how much he was missing be because, because he didn't necessarily see that he was missing it. Yes. But when he could hear all this stuff and he said to me one day, he said, Freya, do you think I could go birding now that I can hear the birds better? <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, yes, yes, yes. yes. So that's, that's really cool. And I just like to, do my part here to normalize hearing aids because like any kind of assistive device if it means if using it makes means that you can do the thing that you want to do please do that because you want to do the thing that you want to do and and please please don't be embarrassed or ashamed i know everyone's got different experiences but just trying to be encouraging um um melanie's got something to add in there yeah, if I could just interject, they actually make a device, I don't know that much about it for birders, that lowers the frequency. So you're still hearing the birds that other people are hearing, but the frequency is lowered so that if you have that high frequency hearing loss, you hear the birds. So well, let me set the record straight. I actually got hearing aids a few years ago, and that was the exact reason I got them. <laughs> because I wanted awesome. them, yeah, but I discovered that they also had negative effects on me as a congenitally blind person. They affected my ability to gauge how far I was away from things when I was inside buildings. And it really, I'm still not completely used to using them. And I admit, I don't wear them all the time because I'm kind of on the edge of hearing loss where for the most part, it causes no problem for me. It's only when I go out birding or when there's a very light sound that other people may hear, but yeah, I do have hearing aids and I expect eventually I'll probably have to get better ones. Sure. Thank, thanks. Thanks, Jerry. <laughs> um, just it's, up it's in the they said it's called song finder and it's oh, not a hearing oh, aid. Yes. just a device for birders. Yeah. Thanks. I've heard, thanks. Melanie. Um, Jerry, um, I had something else to add there. Oh yes. In, in occupational therapy, um, we talk about functional limitations. Mm -hmm. So just because someone has, I don't know. What's an example? Um, they've been diagnosed. Oh, that's a bad, bad example. They've, they've got some diagnosis, some formal diagnosis, but ultimately at this point, there's no kind of, there's no impact on them on the things that they want to do. Yes. That then there's no functional limitation, but yeah. when, when that, whatever that is, that diagnosis, that disability becomes becomes impacting, starts to impact their ability to do stuff. Um, that's now a functional limitation. And we use that terminology in occupational therapy. And I just thought that was interesting because what you just said, Jerry, sounded like um, your hearing loss is not really having a functional impact on you. But in fact, the way you know where you are in space as a totally blind person using hearing aids has a negative 
functional impact on you. So that's kind of really interesting, um, interesting to interesting to learn. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Physical accessibility challenges. We're still going on that. Um, Sarah, have you got a story about a time you went birding and you found yourself with a um, something in the built environment that um, stopped you? Um, yeah, it was pretty close to the time when I took up birding quite seriously. So I was very excited to um, hear about all the rare bird alerts in the area and um, I followed them avidly. And um, the, people kept talking about these boat-tailed grackles that were at um, a certain pond about um, 45, 50 minutes drive away. And so um, I got a friend to go down there with me and we went to the, um, we, di we didn't know much about the, uh, how accessible the pond was, but we got up there, there was a blind. She had to definitely help me on the path. The path wasn't great. But, and we got to the blind and she looks out an opening and spots a boat tilt grackle. And I, there I am, I'm like, I can't reach the ones that are up there and the ones that are down there are for three-year-olds and I couldn't, my view was completely blocked. So um, we kind of laughed about it, turned around and we went somewhere else on the property and, and had a very nice outing. But um, I, I, when I got home, I looked up the um, website for the wildlife refuge and I, I emailed them and I, I told them what happened. And they were so responsive. And they asked me what I needed. They came down with a the crew. They, they put the openings at, at wheelchair height and they improved the path and they improved the parking all in one fell. Wow. Yeah. So, that's um, awesome. Yeah, so sometimes it works out. Yeah, that's a really cool story, Sarah. Thank you. And that's another, there's so many powerful things coming out. I'm going to overuse that word, I think, uh, if I haven't already, but a powerful message um, on the power of one person to make a difference um, and also the power of advocating for your needs because sometimes people don't know that they're doing a thing that's not helpful until you tell them. And most humans are, are kind most of the time I think and so if you let them know like hey that's not cool or hey guys if you're blind sucks um in nicer words um <laughs> probably a good idea but um most people will be I, I would think would be pretty pretty responsive to that so I'm, I'm really glad that you um got on the phone or email and and told them about your experience and um and and they fixed it that's really cool did you ever end up seeing the boat tail grackles there Yes, yes, it was great. Yes. Good. And, and I um, just want to say, I when I reached out to them, I, I tried to keep the, the level of criticism down. It was just, this is what happened. And it would be so great if you guys could add a couple of openings to that blind. And they were, and so when, when they did all that, I was very, very grateful. So, yeah, sure. Yeah, I just, I think sometimes it helps to, um, not be too negative in the way you No, sure. It. Sorry. I, 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 brutal to. summary there from me. <laughs> um, so that might be the opportunity for me to mention. So on our website, again, that's audubon.org slash birdability. Um, we have everything up there that we, um, that we know about. The big, big thing that's on that website is the birdability map, which if you don't know about it already, um, anyone can contribute a birdability review there's a little button and you do like a little quick kind of checkbox survey maybe it takes five or ten minutes um, about the accessibility of a birding site that you've been to don't base it on something you saw online about the information someone had on their website you have to go to the birding site please um, but anyone can go and do these birdability reviews and it's instant gratification because a pin immediately pops up on our birdability map and anyone can scroll around and check out any accessible birding sites near them and read the features of that because lots of places on their website will say it's accessible, but there's a really big difference between something being accessible and something actually being accessible. And like I said before, everyone's requirements are going to be different. So having all that detailed information means that people can make their own decisions about whether they want to tackle that that location or not 
So um, please, please, especially this week, because it's Bird Ability Week, please go um, and do a um, bird ability review of a place near you and help us grow that map so that everyone can find out about places near them. Quick shout out, um, if you're wondering about my accent, I'm actually Australian, um, but I've been living in the US for the last nearly five years after falling in love with a handsome American. And, um, and the map right now, when you go online, you, the map is set to show America or to North America by default, but you can toggle that around. And bird ability, this stuff, this isn't US specific. This is planet, like planet wide, worldwide, worldwide. So if you, um, if you're watching this from Australia, uh, if you're watching this from anywhere, please, please go on there and add um, bird ability reviews. Um, if we get a couple more pins in places that aren't just North America, we might set it so that I, I hope we'll set it so that the whole world will be visible there. So it's immediately apparent um, that this is this is a worldwide conversation. This is not a not a US or a North America specific conversation. Um, while I'm on the website, uh, there's also a link to the Vertibility Birded Survey, and that's something that we created for this week. Um, it will be available until the 15th of November, in case you're you're able to send it to your bird club, um, and they can push it in their newsletter, for example, and it'll take you know that amount of time for people to get to be able to do the survey and send it back in. But um, there's a survey up there um, asking about your experiences birding and it, the accessibility challenges you've faced um, because the Bird Ability Affinity Group, National Audubon's Bird Ability Affinity Group, um, we want to, and Bird Ability in general wants to know the, this information so we know where to tackle um, these barriers first. There's, I know there's lots of work to be done. There's, there's heaps here, but um, we really want to hear your experiences. So please, please do that. Uh, the link is on the website. Uh, and the other thing that's on the website, this was actually the reason I was mentioning this, is that um, Virginia and I are working really hard to finalize some birdability guidance documents. Hopefully they'll be up there by tomorrow. Um, <laughs> we're nearly there. Um, but we've got the one up there already is that language and communication use. Um, we're also going to have one up there about access considerations for birdability reviews and determining if a bird site, a birding location is a good spot to take to lead an accessible bird walk. Um, we're also going to have one up there about steps to implement birdability locally. And we're also going to have one, this is why I thought of it, because of what Sarah said, um, a bit of a template um, so that it, you can just kind of copy it and paste it into your email or whatever to send to your city council or to the wildlife refuge or to whoever it is to say, hey, I visited, that wasn't really that great. Um, do you think maybe you could kind of fix that? It'd be really helpful. Um, and you, while you're at it, you might as well refer them to our website. We'll have that in the template too, um, because maybe the information on our website might help them when they decide like what the best thing to do is. So yeah, check that out. It was a big plug, but we're really proud of our website. And um, also huge shout out to National Audubon's GIS um, consultants, Ryan, Liz and Abigail, because they've been absolute superstars in making that website uh, what it is at this moment. So um, yeah, yeah big, really. mad props to those guys. That's great. Wow, that was a huge tangent. Okay. Um, <laughs> Physical accessibility challenges. Uh, Virginia, have you got a story about one you one one that you ran into and what you did at that time? Oh my gosh, do I have stories? <laughs> um, birding for seventeen years in a wheelchair. Um, if I am birding by myself, I generally try to figure out whatever it is. So many times it's mud. It'll be a real muddy. Um, grassy um, event. Um, I might be wheeling along and realizing that I'm just collecting more and more and more mud on every single wheel. Like so much so that every handful is a handful of mud as I'm wheeling. And at that point, I usually turn around and abandon that idea and try to, try to get back to my car limping along. Um, but there are times where I'll encounter um, a big set of steps 
And uh, the a lot of when I am with people, generally um, I'm a very small person, so generally someone just grabs me and someone else grabs the chair and off we go. And like they, some, they pick you up, they pick you up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they just pick me up and you know, off we go. And so um, that's, that's really a sort of a normal way of moving around for me. Uh, but sometimes we encounter uh, big logs across the trail. I know I had a wonderful experience in East Texas and we were after the Swainson's Warbler. And as we were heading up the trail, we encountered a big fallen tree across the trail. And so the two field trip leaders just one of them picked up the front of the chair, the other picked up the back of the chair. They raised me up, chair and all. And um, I asked someone for music, please. And then over the log we went and back down and on we went to get to the Swainsons. That's so really it's, cool. it's really just a question of figuring things out as you go. And, you know, I have to say that it is one of the things I love doing is being on a trail and encountering a challenge and not knowing how to manage it on my own, but figuring it out. Yeah, that's, cool. To me, that that's one of the joys, you know, the the figuring something out and being able to continue along my way, whatever it might be. It's it's really empowering, right? When you can problem solve something for yourself. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I did that. Yeah. I did that, and I did it by myself. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Super cool. Um, so that actually segues really well. We're going to shift gears, everyone, um, to uh, I'm just going to ask Virginia again about being picked up chair and all or bodily and chair separately. Um, would you recommend that if if someone was on a bird outing with someone else in a wheelchair and they came to some steps and the person in the wheelchair was like, oh, I guess I can't do the steps. Would you recommend that the uh, able-bodied person just pick that person up <laughs> um uh well um, i guess I, I I, i'll give you some more context if okay. if they've never talked to each other before they don't know each other from a bar of soap right. is that an okay is that generally an okay thing to do probably not someone I, else's wheelchair? well i i i would say if if the person knows you well, then it's probably understood that you're about to get picked up and taken up the stairs. But if the, you don't know the person, then probably the first thing for the leader to ask is, do you want to go up? Because a lot of times um, a person in a wheelchair may really be uncomfortable with the idea of someone picking them up and taking them up. So the first question to ask is, do you want to go up? And the second question is, how can we best do that? And let and let the person in the wheelchair direct. Yeah, cool, great. Um, and in general, my understanding is correct me if I'm wrong, but in general, my understanding is um, people should not touch someone else's mobility device or other assistive device uh, unless given permission. That includes wheelchairs. That includes um, walking frames. That includes long canes, like. Um, Jerry, I, I, I don't know if you, you must be a long cane user, right? I um, am, yes. So if someone like, it, it would not be okay, right? If someone just like move your long cane. I would have to whack them with it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah watch out. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's, that's, how you, that's how you know where to go, right? Like that's how you yes. find out where to move. And so like people don't touch someone else's long cane. Um, <laughs> yes, I've actually had... I've had people grab the tip of my cane and try and touch something with it, thinking that, that I can somehow sense from the other end of the cane what that is. It doesn't work so well. Oh, my gosh. Freya, um, I would add and that it happens. That, sorry. Please go ahead, Virginia. Um, I would like to add that some, actually frequently it happens that when people are um, close to me, they may be kneeling down to see what I can see. And I wanted to speak quickly to what Diane was saying when she was trying to make sure that she was giving Di uh, Allison the right perspective, that very frequently it works just the opposite. So I'm at, my eye line is three feet and frequently I see birds that other people aren't seeing. And so I have to realize that they are up at a six foot vision line and then we you know we figured out from there but the point is that a lot of times when people are down trying to see the bird that i am seeing they very frequently 
use my wheelchair to get back up. And <laughs> they all they always have. You know, that's been something that has always happened. And so it may again be that these are just people with whom I'm very familiar, but not always. And I always, you know, I'm always happy to lend a, a hand to anybody trying to get up, especially oh, with grumpy yeah. knees. Yeah, and I, I would add too, I mean, I know Allison had experiences with people, uh, she had a power wheelchair and you can get in some real dangerous situations if somebody oh, yeah. leans on the power stick oh, boy. Uh, and you're not expecting it. <laughs> And I yeah. know she had some, uh, sometimes that happened. So yeah, you just, you, you just can't be um, putting, your, putting your hands on, on equipment, especially when you don't know what, what it, it does. Right. Unless you ask, is it okay? And that person says, yes, because you could also ask, do you need help going through that door, for example? And the person says, no, then, then trust them. Don't, Force your help. That's not a. That's yes. Never appreciated from anybody ever. Don't force the help. If they want it, they'll tell you. Um, if they don't, want, they, then there might be a really good reason why they don't want your help because they probably, for example, with a door and a wheelchair, they've probably gone through millions of doors independently because there's been no one to hold the door open. And they probably they probably got a whole system. And if you hold the door open, you actually might make it harder for them. So if someone says no, just politely and graciously accept that and just stand by for if they want your help later. Don't, even don't, as, take, it, don't take offense, just just be respectful of their-, e their Even as close as we, we were, um, I would always ask, uh, do you want to do it yourself? Do you need help? Tell me, tell me what you need from me. Um, yeah. Because it takes away her power um, if I step in and always think I can fix it. And so, uh, yeah, I think it's, it, you need to be sensitive to that and, and not, not assume that they can't, that someone can't do it because right. they very well might be able to and you stepping in is taking away their ability. Right, right. I, I also think it's important to do it very graciously because you want to encourage people to interact with you. Mm -hmm. And so what I always make a point of doing is saying when they ask, can I help you? I always say, I think I've got it, but I really, and I do make a point, I really appreciate you asking. And just, you know, reaffirming that that's a good gesture is important. That is a great point. Can I ask the, uh, Sarah and Virginia, um, I know one of the things that kind of disturbed Allison, and I see if you've had this experience too, that you go into a visitor center and um, you're going to ask some questions or whatever, and she and I would be there together. And uh, she would often come out and say, did you see that? People were talking to you and not to me. In other words, they're, they're, they're like just ignoring the fact that she's even there when she's sitting right in front of me and uh, talking to me. So I wonder right. what your feet, you know, if maybe you could share a little bit of your feelings if that's happened to you. Yeah, it's happened to me a few times. And I think um, that people are, they just feel uncomfortable in the face of somebody in a wheelchair or with whatever disability we're talking about. And, and it, it's, it's very dehumanizing. And I've had the experience where I will ask the question and the person behind the counter will address the answer to whoever is standing next to me. Right. And it's like, I don't even exist. Well, that really blows my theory because I always thought it was only people who are blind that experienced that. And I thought it was because I couldn't make eye contact with people, but I guess that's not it at all. Yeah. <coughs> I have, that, that I've definitely, you, I have definitely experienced that, Sarah and uh, Diane. And my, this, I really have to practice this. My first response would be, Hello, I'm the person asking the question, but I can't do that because that's alienating. So instead, I will say something like, um, oh, excuse me, I'm going to be the decision maker here. <laughs> so, but I say it in a really nice way, you know, like, okay, but I'm the decision maker. So what is it again? That reminds me of a time we when we could go out together for <laughs> I'd have so much fun with you. 
It reminds me of a time when my wife and I were in a restaurant and the lady took her order and then she said, and what would he like? And my wife paused and said, I have no idea. And then the lady got, she got it. And then she, she uh, responded to me directly. Oh God. Good one, Jerry. Um, I've just been there's, told. There's a few times that that's happened to me actually, is uh, Sometimes uh, when I'm birding with uh, my friends, uh, most of my birding friends are white and I'm obviously black. But sometimes uh, we're out and uh, a non-birder will ask uh, my friend a question and uh, sometimes uh, I'll answer it. And uh, then the person would uh, sometimes keep talking to uh, my friend and just not really acknowledge me. It's mm. yeah. terrible. So, so my, um, my, the, what I understand is that, um, and the way I've been trained to, to go about it is to assume that the person you wish to know the answer from can answer you, ask them directly, like, as if they're another human being, because they are. Um, and if it happens that they have some, some kind of communication um, d disability or they have an intellectual disability, um, and they can't answer you or they can't answer you in a way that you understand, if they're with someone, that other person will probably take over. But start by asking the person first and let, let, let that, don't you make that decision about whether they can understand or whether they can respond. Let, let that come about um, because I don't want, I, like if someone asked my husband, what, what, do, what do I want for dinner? I, you better believe I'd be like, excuse me? As if you know, you don't, and so he might get it right. I mean, he knows me pretty well, but that's not the point. That's not the point. And so, um, yeah, we're all human beings. So please treat us all with respect. Um, thanks guys. You totally blitzed my um, second Sorry. change of gear. No, no, you did it all just beautifully, which was gonna be about um, how the social and cultural environment, as in, other people, other birders can impact your ability to go birding by being um, inappropriate or weird or um, otherwise not inclusive and unwelcoming when you're out birding. And I think, I think that's really important for the able-bodied, the sighted and the neurotypical birders out there to know that being intentionally inclusive it's not enough to just assume that people will know they're welcome. You have to make it really, you have to be intentional about that. You have to make it really clear that people are welcome. And that's, that's, that's on us um, to do. That's not on the person to, to create somehow. That's, that's on the side of the able-bodied and the neurotypical birders to do. Um, I should caveat that slightly with, I say us, I have what I hope is a temporary disability. Um, I hope <laughs> it's looking less and less likely. Um, I have a dodgy knee and I say dodgy, which is very unmedical because it's been 18 months now and no medical specialist has been able to tell me what is causing it. But um, last summer, um, suddenly I was unable to straighten it like overnight. Um, and uh, that really impacted my ability to walk, which meant I couldn't go birding the way I wanted to because I couldn't walk on the trails. Uh, and it's, it's loads better now, but it's not, it's not back to normal whatever that is. Um, and the last information I had two weeks ago was that it is not lupus, which is great news, but it may be um, degenerative joint disease, uh, which is better than lupus, but still not awesome. Um, but there you go, we'll figure it out. I'm, I've, I'm learning, still learning how to manage it best. Uh, that's, I think that's something that, that, that I'll get better at it over time. Hopefully it doesn't get much worse. Anyway. Um, so I'm sort of half in the dis, 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 the birders with disabilities category and half out of it because <laughs> I'm sort of newly in that category. And anyway, it doesn't really matter. Also, putting people in boxes doesn't always help. So um, I'll just forget about that. Before we get to the q and I know Joe is going to have a whole lot of questions from you guys um, to shoot at us, which I'm really excited to hear. But before we do, um, I particularly want to ask Melanie um, to share a bit of her experiences. So Melanie, can you tell us a bit about your work at George Audubon with the Shepherd Centre um, and what you've done in partnership, in collaboration with them um, and why you did it the way you did it? Uh, yes, thanks for asking. I have 
been collaborating with the Shepherd Spinal Center in Atlanta for the past four years. And I lead monthly outings for uh, inpatients, as well as an annual spring retreat and fall clinic to introduce people to birding and get them outside and put binoculars in their hands. A lot of these people um, are newly injured or struggling with new health concerns. Um, so for a lot of the people that I work with, come this birding outing out on the Beltline, which is just around the corner from the hospital is their first time out of the hospital. So I try to focus on all the senses, remembering that not everyone can hold a pair of binoculars. Um, you know, there's just, there's so many different ways to engage in birding. And having worked through the Shepherd Center, I just realized too how unfriendly the world is to people with mobility challenges. Just not enough curb cuts, not enough parking, accessible restrooms. So my biggest challenge in, in running these programs is just finding accessible locations to, to bring people. Oh, so that birdability map, so people contributing birdability reviews, the birdability map would really help you? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. But there's so much poten you know, potential for wellness for all of us to go outside and go birding. And it's something that anybody can do no matter where they are, even when they're in a hospital. So I absolutely. This, this occupational therapist, I'm all about the benefits of nature therapy um, for everybody. There's so much research that documents stuff that we probably should have already known. But anytime you can spend in nature, even if that's, it's, there's scientific evidence that says 10 minutes sitting on a bench in a garden has benefits to your attentional capacity, which I won't go into that further. I'm just putting it out there. Um, it's huge. Nature is good. Go outside, people. Go outside. Um, looking at a window also. Look at, and even looking at photos, um, there's been documented evidence that that can have positive impacts on your health and well-being. So that's pretty amazing. So that's really cool, Melanie. I am so all about your work with the Shepherd Spinal Center. Um, and just really quickly, because we're nearly out of time, um, how did you partner with them? Did, did you reach out to them or did they reach out to you or how did that happen so that other people can maybe do the same thing with their local rehab hospital? Their horticulture therapist reached out to me initially and we had a sit down face-to-face -face meeting and created a plan to start offering birding related activities to her patients. I have since reached out and connected with the recreational therapy department at Shepherd. So, but there's so much potential. I haven't even been able to scrape this, the surface. We have a veterans hospital in Atlanta, senior communities. So I would just like to encourage people that are field trip leaders or nature centers or Audubon chapters, reach out to some of these community groups and see how you can collaborate because there's a need and um, you know certainly just a desire to spread good in the world. Yes, yes. All it takes is you reaching out and being intentionally inclusive, right? That's that's really really cool. Um, that that just can I, you really. Happy. Can I just add, birding is so therapeutic. I mean, I just know MS is a really bad disease that um, takes away so much from you. And I know that birding brought Allison such joy. And the time that she would spend doing it was just so uplifting and empowering because you can you see what you can do and you see the beauty of the birds. And even if you just sit there and absorb that for a half an hour on one bird, uh, that, that brought a lot to her. So I can vouch for the therapy nature of, uh, therapeutic nature of birding. Thank you, When, I, when Thank I, you. I am I'm focusing on a bird and really trying to find that bird and then really trying to identify it, I completely forget about my back pain and all my health problems, it, it takes, it transports me out of my disability. That's amazing. Wow, that's so cool. Thanks, thanks very much. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Diane. And thank you, Sarah, for adding all that. That's really, really cool. Um, and here comes Joe, because he's desperate to ask us questions that the audience has sent in. So um, without further ado, um, thank you, everyone. Joe, what have you got for us? Wow. 
I'm excited, y'all. This is great stuff. Um, please forgive the y'alls. Uh, I'm from Alabama. Can't help it. Uh, there have been questions all across the board, uh, everything from very specific questions to very big picture questions. I'm going to start out with, and people are still asking questions, which is going to confuse me, but that's okay. Um, I'm going to start out with a question that anybody and everybody can answer if they want to, uh, and it's a big picture question. Uh, what one thing would make birding a better experience for you? And I'm going to throw it to Virginia. And if you'll, when you finish answering your question, just anybody else that wants to chime in, chime on in. I would say that the thing that will make birding better for me is that I am able to get on a trail and wheel for hours. I'll uh, send it to Sarah. Well, um, I have basically the same answer, except I'd be really happy if I could just, if there were like five places I knew I could drive to within one hour from my house and be assured that I could get, park safely, get to the trail and be on there even just for one hour, I'd be happy. But um, there's so many ifs in, in all of those conditions. Yeah. Send it to somebody, Sarah. Oh, Jerry. That's okay. okay. If I could go to a birding club and people would um, help me to introduce myself to them and begin to get to know me and offer an arm so I could go birding with them, I would be the happiest guy in the world. Love it. Can I just jump in there really quick? Offer an arm. So as a sighted guide to help. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We there's so much more to talk about um, about birders with vision impairments. Um, that's a conversation that I'm really excited to have at some future point. So we stay tuned, everybody, for more more from Jerry. Um, Joe, is there anything else? Yeah. Oh boy, there's so many more things. Um, on a on a different scale, I guess we talked about the one thing that would make everything great. Uh, is there one major barrier to birding? or access to nature in general for you that people who are interested in improving the natural area accessibility should focus on. Um, and I'll throw it to you, Melanie, if you wanna just have try have a shot at that. I, where to begin? There's so much work we can do, but I would just say all of us put on that lens of experiencing the world from different perspectives, whether it's Virginia's three foot wheelchair level or, um, you know, whatever else that may be, Jerry with his vision impairment, but just put on the lens and notice things as you're going through your day about what are those obstacles because identifying them is the first step to, to breaking them down. And we've also, I'll just, yeah, I'll just add in quickly another plug for the birdability map. Sarah said before that one of her big things was if she knew of five trails or five locations she could get to. So everybody, if you can fill out a bird ability review and help populate that map, I know I've heard from a lot of other birders too, that that would be absolutely the most valuable resource to get them outside, knowing um, with some level of certainty whether it's worth making the trip to that spot um, and, and what spots are around that, that, that they might be able to navigate. So. Um, that we can all contribute to that. You can all be, well, you're already all part of the birdability movement because you tuned in tonight. So welcome. We're glad to have you on board. Um, please keep being part of it um, and help us um, by, by completing some birdability reviews of places near you. Joe. Uh, what a nice question, I think that comes really at a, at a challenging time because of COVID because we're not really doing any outings, but what about an outing description do you find useful particularly? And how, do you, how does it help Audubon chapters and other bird clubs? How, do, how can they help you feel more um, able to get out and go birding? Yeah, uh, and I'm gonna just start toss somebody. Off. Great. I'll start us off because I am a regular walk leader. I should have mentioned this at the start, but I lead uh, kids bird walks for San Fernando Audubon and uh, I lead bird walks for the Audubon Center at Debs Park and the city of Glendale most months. But uh, 
I think an important thing to consider when leading a bird walk is automatically assume that everybody has a different experience, everybody has a different way of doing things. And I think it would be a good thing for all walk leaders, myself included, to start off the walk by checking for mobility and sensory issues. I can see, uh, okay, do I need to adjust the walk for anybody or should we just uh, go full speed ahead? Thank you awesome. whoever asked that question too because I now have a new idea for a guidance document for the BirdAbility website. <laughs> um, thank you for giving me more work, um, it's awesome. Um, so we will get that up there as soon as we can. Um, again, we're trying hard to get stuff up tomorrow, um, before tomorrow. Um, quick plug, tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern, same place, Facebook Live, and you can re register for the Zoom um, webinar. Virginia Rose, founder of BirdAbility, the lady that began it all, um, is going to be presenting on um, access considerations. So it's going to be a bit more like a lecture kind of presentation um, and more sort of technical information about how you find accessible bird sites and what accessible bird sites are not. Um, I, she's got some great photos, <laughs> that, um, but um, definitely tune in there too, because there's going to be a lot of information there. And again, it will be um, recorded and posted on our website and everywhere else we can um, so that you can um, tune in after the fact as well. So, um, sorry, Joe, back to you. Oh, that's okay. This is, this is a really, I think, an interesting question. And we've got some people that are great birders and have been doing this for a long time. Um, have any of you done any ability hacks to make your birding easier? In other words, do you use any adopted equipment? I'm a quad and can't hold the binoculars and adjust the focus at the same time. A quad, a quad being a quadriplegic. So four limbs, a spinal cord injury that um, affects both, for all four limbs. Not necessarily um, completely unable to use um, arms and hands, but some part of that is affected. That's a whole nother story. Um, but just so everyone knows what a quad is. Um, yeah, adaptive equipment for birding. That's a really cool question. What? I don't know if you'd call it adaptive equipment for birding, but um, I always be sure to have a scope that I can, um, that for instance, if Allison and I were birding that I could set up for her, she couldn't always, as this questioner asked, can't, couldn't always hold up uh, binoculars, especially for any length of time. And so if I could set the scope up uh, for her so that she could uh, continue to look through that for longer periods of time. So I don't know that you'd call that adaptive equipment, but um, it's something that did allow her to enjoy the birds with, which she wouldn't have been able to do it without. Rhea. Can I, oh, can I just I, chime in really quickly? Um, Rhea, I, I need to speak to this. Oh, please, please. I have a scope. Precision camera helped me to put a, an armed adaptive quip, um, I don't know how to describe it, on my wheelchair. And so it clamps onto my wheelchair and I can wheel around with it and the scope is right here. All I have to do is put my eye down on it. And so in fact, I think it was Minnesota Audubon found out about that scope, contacted me and said, give us all the information, we're gonna buy a scope in our office. And then whenever a person in a wheelchair comes, we can just slap that scope right there on their chair. That's so cool. That's so cool. And awesome work, Minnesota Audubon. Um, hey, every other Audubon Tucker and Nature <laughs> Center. Do it. Just got a really good idea right there. Um, oh, quick note on that too. The first most important thing is to have accessible features at your nature centers and trails. The second most important thing is to have, I don't know, this is my theory. The second most important thing is to have your staff and volunteers trained in what those features are. Because if no one knows about that amazing scope in the back room, because no one's asked to use it for a couple of months, it doesn't help anybody. So staff and volunteers need to be trained in this stuff and preferably also trained in some kind of disability awareness communication stuff so they don't make things awkward. Um, again, start with that document on our website um, if you've got nowhere else to turn to, but um, that's really cool. And another note on scope, um, an, another wheelchair user um, gave me a really good suggestion, which is if you're holding a bird outing and you're going to be like parked at like, like a lake for a while, have a scope set up so that walking people can use it and have a scope set up at the right height, just already, just set up from the start so that a wheelchair user can get up to it because 
they have to ask you to put it down, they might not want to do that. And you're not being intentionally welcoming and inclusive. So if you just have it set up from the beginning, you're like, that's really cool as well. So I know that's not quite the answer to the question that was asked, um, but I just wanted to add that in there too, because I think that's important. Um, can share. I real quick, can I real quick say, um, please go to my blog and there is a post called The Scope. And in it is where I describe the scope and how in very, very important it is for people who are in wheelchairs to be able to participate in the scope line. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So um, yep. I'm watching the clock. I know we've officially got one more minute left. Um, I just want you to know that I wrote these things down. I have this list that keeps growing, even though I've been working hours and hours on Vertibility Week <laughs> for the last two weeks. It keeps yeah. growing and growing because there's so much more to do. And there's um, it's just really exciting. Um, the conversations that are happening and the awareness that's being raised. And I, I'm so excited to be part of it. Um, the scope, Virginia, we might try and get that on the big website too, just so everyone gets to it. Um, I think that's gonna be really valuable technical information to share. Um, and anything, any other questions, um, I'm gonna get hold of the questions that you all ask via Facebook and via Zoom. Um, shout out to my own personal Instagram. It's at the OT Berta. OT for occupational therapist. Um, I'm doing a lot of posting this week, particularly, but it will continue um, about um, Vertibility Week and all this stuff. So any questions that um, I can, I'll try and see if I can answer. And I might, I'll, I'll try and like field answers from these guys as well, um, as that that might be the best for now, the best way to to try and answer questions that we didn't get to. I'm, I'm sure there were lots more. Um, this conversation isn't going to stop here. Like I said, um, National Audubon have been incredible in their support with putting together Birdability Week. And they've told me already um, that they're really interested in um, help supporting us host more of these conversations going forward. So that's really, really exciting. So stay tuned, um, follow me on Instagram, uh, check out our website. That's where all this information is going to be. If you want to get in touch with one of the panelists tonight, um, please email birdability for everybody. That body part is really important because different bodies, right? Everybody, birdability for everybody at gmail.com. Uh, that's the email address that we just set up this week. Um, that's kind of the one-stop vertibility <laughs> contact um, place. And I will pass anything that comes in there on to the right people. Um, that's just the easiest way to do it. Um, vertibility for everybody at gmail.com and audubon.org slash vertibility and at the OT Verda on Instagram. Um, I think that's about all we've got time for. Quick thank you um, to Joe for monitoring the questions and Devon and Christine all behind the scenes and Heather and Elaine and Bob all behind the scenes making this happen right now. And um, major thanks to everyone else at National Audubon who supported Vertibility. Oh, and also Taiki James who gave me some really invaluable guidance in moderating a panel. This is the first time I've done this. So um, really grateful for his um, mentoring um, in this. And um, yeah. Well, we look forward to meeting you all out on the trail. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Bye. So fun. Bye.